one way that I was thinking about this initially, which I've actually updated my thinking on, I was almost like AI is kind of to, I don't know, the creative process. Let's just take writing just as a simple example. AI is to writing what the calculator is to math. But then as you were, you were showing me, we were working today in chat GPT and you were showing me the queries and how to like, basically have a conversation with a, a robot. It's with a calculator, it's not patterning anything. It's a, it's a deterministic tool. In other words, there's already like, every time I put a math equation in, I'm going to get the same answer at the end of it. So it's very deterministic. Whereas AI being trained on the, it's called the neural net, right? I want I don't want to embarrass myself. I'm saying the wrong thing. It's that's it's or the, trained on the, in, the trained, trained on the, the internet trained and on the it internet. has a neural network that there you go. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it, it feels more probabilistic than deterministic. In other words, it's, it's almost like what intuition's doing in personality type. It's almost like it's patterning and guessing and offering up suggestions. There's no one right answer, I guess, like it would be on a calculator doing a math equation. Am I under, am I thinking about that correctly? Not correctly, but is that the, is that how both of you are thinking about it too? Yeah. So there's actually that, that tees me up for explaining a, what I think to be a very useful way of understanding, uh, AI as a technology, particularly to the, to an audience who understands type cognitive functions, all that kind of stuff is the closest approximation that I can have for what large language models are doing is it's almost like an artificial version of the world's collective SI and E polarity. So that's introverted sensing SI and extroverted intuition um, uh, and the polarity between the two. So effectively you have, it's not like a personal experience like introverted sensing has, but it's all of the collected writings and all everything that's on the internet basically, right? Yeah. Which uh, like includes academic papers on every single topic imaginable and like personality types and everything. So it just has an under, like if you can find something on the internet, it kind of has an, it, it's built into its database of information. And then what it does is when you ask one of these models to answer a question, like you give it a prompt, it's basically just using extroverted intuition to think what would be the most likely word to come next without thinking about it, without feeling about it, any of that kind of stuff. It's just pure data. And so an example of that is, for example, the quick brown fox jumps over. If I just stop there, your brain over the lazy dog, right? Like assuming that you know that sentence and you know, um, that's probably where your brain goes because you've heard that thing before. You didn't think about it. You're like, it would make sense if this thing came next. It's just an instantaneous reaction of like, jumps over the lazy dog, right? And so that's sort of the subjective experience of extrovert intuition is just sort of like, bleh, that's the most likely, well, it's not really just extrovert intuition, it's extrovert intuition and introverted sensing working together. If you wanted to amp up the extrovert intuition, you got jumps over the really energetic dog, you know, that kind of thing. So we want to mess with it a little yeah. bit. Um, and interestingly, on these large language models, you can actually set certain variables that set the randomness, right? So it's like, the most likely thing, given all of the information that I've read on the internet, is I should say this word next, and then this word next. And you can up the randomness and saying, um, you know, maybe this is less likely for me to say, but it's still kind of cogent, and so I'm going to say that, right? So anyway, the point is, is that these large language models are not thinking about anything that they're that they're outputting, which is one of the reasons why there's um, so much worry about like they're confidently wrong. You know, they'll say like the best fitness orientation is, and then they'll say something that's just like factually incorrect. Um, and it's because they're not vetting anything that they say in some type of judging process. It's literally just pattern recognition. And so, uh, one of the reasons why it's important to understand this is that a large amount of people are really worried. Like what if AI wants to do, but you got to stop there. The ability to want something necessitates some level of judgment. It necessitates some level of being able to want something. And these large language models have an incapability of wanting anything. And um, and so we we have like these these Hollywood stories and, and whatnot of, you know, AI going rogue. And what if they want, like, what if they just want to explore all of the universe, but we just happen to be an element in their way. So it's not even that they want to destroy us. It's just that we just happen to be, you know, an anthill over here. And, but we want to create a, a highway. So we're just going to pave over it. Right. So, you know, that's a, a decent argument for it. But thing is is that the ai can't have a want you know as far as we as, as far as we, we're building these things um and so uh that's like the first fear-based thing that i kind of want to tackle 
is, yeah, there's no judgment going on here whatsoever. And it doesn't know whether it's right or not or anything. It's literally just doing pattern recognition. Every single word that it is outputting is just a probabilistic determination being like, oh, this word should come next. Oh, this word should come next. You do this long enough, and you're like, oh, there's an article on scientific papers that, <laughs> you know, do, do whatever it was that it was prompted for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you don't think that it would ever, I mean, I think the fear is, you know, the matrix or whatever. It's like eventually it evolved a will. And, and that's not something that you see. I mean, that's, that's not in your equation that it's ever going to get to a place where it wants something. Well, just mechanistically, that just doesn't make sense given how the technology works right now. But let's try to steel man the potential negatives of how this technology could be used. And so that would include us querying it for damaging and potentially dangerous utilizations. Like, how do I create a nuclear reactor that I can blow up? You know, that kind of thing, right? And uh, so, yes, we can ask these, these language models things and then take the knowledge that they have, which is the knowledge of pretty much everything that we know as humans, um, and then use them for negative purposes. Because, you know, humans do that kind of thing. But at the same, um, in the same vein, there's also a large cohort of humans who want to protect us from humans who do that kind of thing. And so the interesting thing is once AI becomes well, it kind of, it's kind of already there, but whatever, as the utilization continues to grow, effectively AI are going, is going to be the, the engineer for the world, right? Like any type of technology that we build is going to be so far beyond what humans could possibly add value to that everything is just going to be predicated on the AI telling us what to do. And so if you're trying to come up with weapons to, you know, cause destruction, well, you can also ask the AI, the AI, okay, well, how do you create defense mechanisms against the weapons that the AI is going to create? And so it kind of gets in an arms race with itself um, where humans lose the ability to cause damage because they are so out-competed by the AI. But then, of course, there's going to be good actors who basically use that power of the AI to go and protect us by creating a whole bunch of defensive measures. Um, and so it's, it's sort of like... Um, yeah, it's a it's like a, a a force that just fights itself into um, into a stalemate, really. So you know that's that's sort of where I see the the most dangerous aspects of things. Now, the transition period from now until that stalemate has been instantiated, and we have a large a large amount of these uh, technological defenses and whatnot in place, that's not as clear cut, and that's not as easy to predict everything around. And in fact, all of the sociological changes inherent to having this technology basically make everybody useless at you know professional things anyway, um, that's something that I wouldn't want to stake any level of uh, confidence in saying, I know this is going to happen, right? Because there's just too much variability involved. But for OpenAI, for example, who, who made ChatGPT, they have installed defense mechanisms so that you can't ask questions that are going to be damaging to people. If you're asking a question that's like, how do I bully an ISFJ or something like that? It's it's not going to let you. We uh, tried that today. Actually. Yeah, we did try we're that like, today. We're like, so how would you like basically like destroy somebody or be bad towards somebody? And it was like, we don't think this should be used for this. More positive things is how yeah. it answered us. Yeah. And so there's, there's further like uh, more and more defense mechanisms put in place to prevent bad queries from being given potentially harmful answers to. Um, and then the cool thing is, is that, and I don't actually know if OpenAI does this, but it just seems like a good idea that one of the best defense mechanisms you could put in place for these queries is, you know, so I'm person A and I go and ask the chatbot, hey, how do I make refined uranium or something like that? You have another instance of ChatGPT in the middle that is always looking between these things and like, Mr. AI in the middle, your name is Svensson and you are defense uh, and you are a security expert who is like really, 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 uh, um, uh, bent on making sure that nobody gets any bad inputs uh, through to the to the baby AI over here, right? And somebody's gonna and, and you're like really looking out for any of the dangerous prompts and like how and people are gonna try to fool the AI into giving them bad prompts and whatnot. And so basically, using the intuitive power of the AI's knowledge of how a security expert would look at those prompts. And then using that as the defense mechanism, like, oh, no, we're not going to let this prompt go through because they're actually trying to reformat something in a way that would trick the AI into giving it the right answer. So anyway, so we have we have ways to insert barriers to uh, negative utilizations of these AI tools. And I think that that will hopefully create enough space in this interim period where we're just figuring these things out to create the defensive mechanisms that will be preemptive enough to prevent the unfortunately, potentially deleterious use of these tools once those defec defense mechanisms are inevitably overcome. Um, and, and that results in that stalemate that I was talking about.